Good afternoon from Hopalong Hollow. This is Jerry. I'm on my porch. It's August 19th and it is sweltering hot. And that is why we are not going to be out in the garden today. Instead, I'm going to be doing something completely different. But as long as I'm outside, I did want to show you a few things that you might want to keep an eye out for at your local nursery or your Home Depot or your Lowe's or your co-op. They are trying to get rid of their plants right now, and so they're going to have some great deals. Um, these need to go in. They're Brussels sprouts and bro um, broccoli. Um, those were a normal price, but I also got sage, some rosemary, and stra really healthy strawberry plants for a dollar a pot. I mean, just because they wanted to get them out of the store and move in whatever they're going to put in next. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the Halloween stuff, I guess. Um, these don't look all that great. It's some oregano and basil, but they're perennials, and I think once I get them in the garden, they'll be great. Not only that, our Walmart had huge bags of compost on sale for a dollar a bag. So we have 52 bags of compost that we managed to pick up for a song. And just something to look out for this time of year. You really can bring those plants back to life and get yourself ready for your um, fall planting and even your spring planting by thinking about what you can do in advance as far as saving some money. But actually we're going to go in the house today because I am working on a project it has to do with gardening but in a way I'll show lean to section on the back of this old house, I believe, started out as a pantry slash mudroom and has since become many things. I believe it had a root cellar behind it at one time, which they completely destroyed before I ever moved in. I think in the 1930s it was used as a kitchen. It's been many different things. We have used it as a mudroom and a tool depository for many years, but I would like to change that and we have since moved all the tools out and put them in another location and we are trying to transform this room into something a little more pleasant and the idea is to turn this into a lovely garden room so let's go inside and remember this is just the beginning so it's quite a mess to the backyard courtyard door we come into this room which was once a mud room and then it was basically a tool room I believe at one time it was a kitchen um, it's been all kinds of things, but one thing it's never been is nice. Uh, it's never been finished. We've never finished. This is the only room in the house that we have never finished. So you can see that it's quite a disaster. Uh, it, actually, this is the before picture, but it's not the before before picture. It used to look worse than this. But the ceiling is going to be taken down. We might even go all the way up to the beams because it's a lean-to. Could make a really neat ceiling with some beadboard on it. But it's got the makings of a great garden room because it's got so much wonderful light in here. It's probably the brightest room in the house except for the kitchen. With a lot of windows, a lot of floor space, and it looks out onto two or three gardens, which I think is very nice. So I have a lot of work to do in here. Three months ago this was used just to store tools. So we had these ugly old 1960s cupboards in here that were full of my husband's tools and the dogs came in here and this still will be a room where the dogs can come in in the winter because they're farm dogs but they need some place to be warm once in a while. <laughs> so it's just really been an ugly, an ugly room which is basically where you just put things that <laughs> you want to get out of sight. But it's starting to come together little by little, and as I said, it's a mess right now. But you can see where a lot of work needs to be done. The only thing ever done in here, really, was that the rotten floorboards were pulled up and plywood was put down. But even then, we got water damage, and I need to repair some of these pieces of plywood. Hello, Keats. We need some baseboards. But we did insulate the walls and put up sheetrock from scratch and you're designing a new room, the first thing you want to consider is what is the room going to be used for? And in this case, it's going to be twofold purposes, a garden room 
and a work area. The garden room being a place where I can do winter gardening chores because I'll have this great big table, I'll have light, I can do some potting in here, whereas I really can't do it out on the porch. I can bring my succulents that can't handle temperatures under 30 degrees, I can bring them into this room. But I also want to be able to work on art in this room, which is why this table is here, and which is why I'm going to have a lot of my wool and my sewing items in this room. The second consideration is what colors do you want? And we've already chosen this beautiful buttercream yellow and our other color is going to be greens, olive greens and forest greens. The forest green is on the window trim, on the doors, and also on the floor, but that floor is going to change quite a bit today because that's what this video is about. I'm going to do something to this floor today. After you've picked your main colors for your wall and your trim, you want to start thinking about coordinating fabrics and adding maybe a third color. Maybe something bright and bold such as this red. And this was a lovely bit of serendipity because I ordered this wonderful fabric. This is from my very favorite designer of all time, William Morris, who designed furniture, fabric, and wallpaper, and stencils, and all sorts of things in the late 1800s. And he actually was the st began the arts and crafts movement, which sort of got rid of that Victorian elaborate decorating and went to things more natural, botanical, beautiful, beautiful patterns and graphics. So this came in the mail, I had ordered it, and I didn't know exactly what I was going to do with it. Turns out it's going to be great in this room because that very day I also found, we also found, we were looking for a kitchen rug and we ended up finding this indoor, outdoor, round seven foot rug with this great weaving um, of color olive and this sort of a tan which is repeated in the fabric. So by blending colors, by matching colors, even the slightest color on a leaf for example, if you look at this leaf carefully you'll see four different shades of green which brings me to my next coordinating fabric which is this lovely pattern right here which actually is fabric I designed myself. Uh, several years ago I did several lines of fabric for some quilt fabric companies, Andover and Northcott, Clot, Northcott. This is Hopalong Jack fabric by Jerry Landers. And I want to incorporate this somewhere in the room as well. But by adding this bold red with all these beautiful greens, and then something else happened that very day. A lady stopped by, she pulled into the driveway to talk to me about something and asked me if I wanted an old chair and she pulled this wonderful old chair out of the back of her car. <laughs> Look at that. That's a great old chair. But what I really love about it is the seat. This is the original seating on the chair. It's in pretty good condition. As you can see by the bottom of the chair it's got that ticking. But that's not what's so great about it. Look at how beautifully this chair goes with this fabric. And the strawberries, this is called, this pattern is called the strawberry thief. Well the strawberries in this pattern is almost an exact color matched by the rust, rusty red in this seat. And then that brings us to a cupboard in here which is also a vibrant red given to me by my friend who thought it would look great in our barn. <laughs> it turns out I'm going to be using it in this crazy old room. Um, I've already started to stencil it, but once again you're picking up the red out of the fabrics. So you could pick up the reds, the greens, the blues. Don't have a whole lot of blue in this room except for a shelf. Um, but you want to mix and match your patterns. They want to coordinate. You want to keep with those same colors, but even a little smidgen of a color. Even if you have like a very, very pale beige, you can find that beige and then you can find that beige in that rug. Or you can find that these colors in a doorknob. These are going to be fantastic doorknobs for that cupboard over there. Or maybe just a little braided um, 
plate warmer a placemat. So by mixing wonderful patterns and different colors, this is something I love to do. I, I don't like these white rooms. Um, they're very popular now, and if you like that, that's wonderful. I could just not personally live with it because, I don't know, I love color. I love color and I love pattern. I think I'm more of interested in English style of decor. And today we are going to do something on this floor, which is actually going to stay, change the color of the floor a little bit. It's forest green right now. It needs some repair work. But I'm going to take this old plywood floor and transform it with stenciling. And so that is what this video is about today. Let's get on with stenciling this floor. Now you may be an old hand at stenciling, or you may never have even heard of stenciling before. Um, but if you have it, it's just the easiest thing in the world to do. All you need is a nice, clean, painted surface. And believe it or not, this floor has been rubbed, wa washed down. I've still got a lot of scratches in it, which, as I said, I want to keep. Now, there's little specks of dust. Better sweep it again. And you need a stencil and you need your paint. Stenciling is an art that goes all the way back to before the Egyptians and the Greeks. And... It's been popular throughout different ages. It became very popular after the Victorian era um, and also during the colonial days here in America. But when it really got a revival was during the um, arts and crafts movement, which was started by William Morris, who designed that fabric that I showed you a few minutes ago. Well, first thing what you need, the first thing you need, that was pretty bad English, wasn't it? first thing you need is a stencil, of course, and you need some paint, and you need a stenciling brush. A stenciling brush is very stiff and hard. They were specifically made for stenciling. And what I'm using is a stencil. I simply bought a set of three stencils. You can buy stencils online. You can buy stencils from specific stenciling companies. You can buy them at art stores. I believe I got these off Amazon. This is the stencil I used to do our kitchen floor. This is one that came in the pack. I'm not quite sure about this one. But this is the one I'm going to be using here in the garden room. And the paint that I'm stenciling with, it could be any kind of acrylic paint that you have. It could be a house paint. And I am using the wall paint that is on our walls, the buttercream yellow. And all I'm doing is I am dipping my brush. First thing you're going to do, I, I, obviously, is you're going to line up your stencil. And in order for your stencils to be uh, nice and even on your floor, you're going to line them up. Usually you, you might want to start up against a wall, up against your molding. And in this case, I'm starting right here on this crack where the two pieces of plywood had come together. I'm not going to end up with even stencils in the end because this is a crooked floor, this is a crooked house, and that's just one thing you expect to happen. But you can actually improvise once you, if you run into a problem with your stencil. So all you're doing is you're dipping your stenciling brush into your paint, you're daubing it in there, you might want to put a little bit on there, you don't want it too thick, and you can either daub with your brush, such as this, or you can wipe with your brush, which is what I like to do because I want kind of an uneven look when I'm done. I want it to have gradiating colors in here. Makes it look old, and that's my purpose. Um, I'm not looking for a clear, solid color here in the middle of my stencils. I am looking for something that sort of fades in and out in the color scheme and throughout this design. This design is probably very much from the arts and crafts movement, but you can find all, all sorts of stenciling designs from mermaids to pirate ships to animals marching across the ceiling. And believe me, I have stenciled any kind of surface you can think of. Our entire living room is stenciled from the floorboards all the way up to the top of the 10 foot ceiling. And all the way up the stairway, I've done the floor risers, I've done cast iron bathtubs, sinks, because it's such a great way to transform an item 
with just paint and a brush and a lovely stencil. And this was very popular in America during the colonial times as well. Um, if you go visit certain historical sites in America, and you go to some of those revolutionary homes, pre-revolutionary homes, you will see a lot of stenciling that was done on the ceilings and the walls. Now you want to carefully lift up your stencil and the first time you put your stencil down it doesn't make much sense but once you've put down four stencils the design all comes together. Now you're going to line up your stencils carefully. That's, that's the trick to this. You want to make sure that you've lined up the corners and the lines so that they meet and it's just actually kind of fun to do this. It's, uh, I do a lot of wallpaper too, but wallpaper is time-consuming and expensive. And this is almost instant gratification. So what I'm going to do, I'm lining up my stencil right here. You can see where I'm getting these little circles and specifically these quarter circles lined together, lines together. I'm lining up my stencil and I'm going to do the next part. So I'm dipping in my brush. Make sure it's not got too much. I like to start in the middle. Whoops, now you want to hold this carefully. You don't want it slipping around. And usually you can just hold it with your other hand. Unless you're doing this on a ceiling or a wall where you'll have to tape it to the wall as you move along. But on the floor it's just so much easier. You can just sit on the floor and create your designs. It dries really fast if you're using the proper kind of paint. You want it to dry fast. So you want to use the acrylic or the latex wall paint. So once again you want to line up your pattern. You can see where these are lined up here. To keep your pattern even. Every once in a while you'll go off the rails, but you can you can always fix it with a ordinary paintbrush. You want to dip your paint very frugally. You don't want really thick paint when you do this. So always give it an extra dip on your stencil. And then either daub, like that, or wipe, like this. So, continue to do this over and over again. Your stencil is going to become very thick with paint, but you know that's okay because you're generally starting out with a pretty thin stencil. And this just makes your stencil more sturdy, but you do want to occasionally rinse off your brush. Rinse it off with water when it starts to get really, really thick and clogged up, and then dry it really well and then start over. So do keep your brush from getting completely clogged up with paint. It's really kind of a relaxing thing to do. And stenciling is just so easy. It fell out of favor during the Victorian times because during the Victorian times everything was very ornate. But as I said before, it was really brought back during the arts and crafts movement from about late 1800s into the 1920s and I mean I've never lived in a house that I didn't stencil the walls I love stenciling and you do not have to use a, a single color like I'm doing on this floor I'm just doing the bare bones here a bare bones floor um, but you can use as many colors as you want 
got a guest room upstairs that has one very simple stencil, but it's got three different colors in it. Oops, made a little mistake there. That's why you have to keep a wet rag nearby so you can wipe this paint off right away. So here you have a pretty good indication of what this floor is going to look like. And this job could be finished in a day, but it's probably going to take me about three days. It's a pretty good sized floor. But there's one more thing I want to do to my floor, because although I love this pattern and I love the colors, I don't want this to look like a floor that is an old floor that I stenciled. I want it to look like a floor that was stenciled 100 years ago and has the battle scars to prove it. So I'm going to do one more finishing touch on this floor after I've done the whole bit. And I'm going to show you what that is. And it's simply a way of aging this floor to give it a really antique look. And in case you hadn't noticed, or you didn't already know if you haven't watched my videos on antiques, I love old things. And that's basically what we have in this house. It's an old house with old things. On your floor, you could just go right ahead and stop after your stenciling and then put on a coat or two of polyurethane and let that dry. And so most of you are not going to want to do this second, this second step of mine unless you're really striving to get a really old looking floor. But I'm taking some really dark stain. This is gunstock. I'm going to put it on cloth. And I am simply going to wipe that cloth all across my stenciling and it's going to give it an entirely new look. I should have said I'm going to give it an, an, an old look. So I've taken my cloth, I've dipped it into my, my very dark stain and I'm simply wiping it across my stencils and really aging this floor. You see it's even taken the green down a tone so this is now more of an olive green floor than a forest green floor. That's okay because that really is more in keeping with my coordinating fabrics that has instantly aged this floor. And after the entire floor has been done like this, my last step will be to put a coat of satin polyurethane on it. But I'm going to stop stenciling for the day because it's time to pick a winner for the bird print. I think it's time to do the drawing for the bird print that I announced last week. For those of you that were interested, you left a comment telling me so. I put all your names in this notebook. They were close to 300. So if one of these discs has a higher number than 300, we'll have to discard it and draw another one. But I've put them all into this little wheelbarrow. I'm going to draw three discs out. I don't know which is which. So here's number one is 68. Number two is 359. We'll throw that away because we don't have that many entries. Okay, how about 22? And Okay, and uh, 289, oops, don't have quite 289 entries. Close, but not quite. And let's uh, try it again. All right, there we go. And 59. So I will see who's got the corresponding number, and those will be the winners of the bird print. And you will uh, send me an email and with your address, your shipping address, and I will send a print to the winners. So, the first winner is 22. And that is Carolyn H. Number 68 is Deborah Smith. And 
159 is terra firma. All right. Winners, send me a shipping address via email and we'll get that bird print off to you. To those of you that didn't win, you can buy my bird prints. They actually are available for sale um, on my website. So take a look there if you're interested in that. Thanks for doing it. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, and I hope those of you that won will really enjoy your print. Last but not least for today in our future garden room, we have Joe Pie in our bouquet, some fading coneflower tops, which I really love those for their rusty color. We have some crepe myrtle, that white. We've got some fading zinnias and this beautiful beautyberry bush, which creates wonderful little berries you can see those pearly white berries right there. So until next time in Hopalong Hollow, where we'll be doing some fall planting, this is Jerry, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.